My name is Sadia Caron, and yes, I'm an incest survivor. It's one part of my identity, and it's what I've been asked to talk about today. And I am not alone. Every nine minutes, a child in America is sexually assaulted, and I was one of them. My goal today is to discuss how being an incest survivor impacts my life in a business setting, a social setting, and in a romantic setting. And if you yourself are a survivor of sexual assault, I have some tips on how to manage this particular aspect of trauma. Now, incest is a very specific form of sexual assault, but it falls under the umbrella of harassment. Most people are familiar with sexual harassment from those videos that HR makes us watch during orientation at a new job. The idea is that harassment is a public space issue. Women get groped on the subway or catcalled on the street, and yes, sometimes we listen to inappropriate jokes at work. But within that idea is the concept that home is a safe place and a happy place. But what if the abuse happens inside the home? What if you are too young to understand it, too young to get away, and too young to take care of yourself? In my case, the abuse started when I was 18 months old. It escalated to rape. I was too young to understand it. I knew that it was wrong and that I must have done something really bad to get treated that way. Now, usually at this point, people have questions. What? How? Huh? If that's your reaction, I'm really glad that this sort of trauma is completely foreign to you. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Any child born into that family would have suffered the same abuse that I did. I just existed. All children love their parents. Every child thinks their daddy is a hero. This is normal. So what was so different in my family? Let me paint a picture for you. My dad was really nervous and nerdy. He could read books in Latin and had no friends. He hated arguments and thought any show of emotion was a sign of weakness. My mom, though, was way more outgoing. She claimed my dad was no fun. She got really drunk at some society party, and my dad just never forgave her. I believe my mom was also an incest survivor, and the curse is the fear that we are unlovable. My dad never forgave her, and he was a Christian who went to church on Sunday, but he missed the forgiveness part. So the more wildly emotional my mom became, the more coldly he treated her, and it just became this cycle. And into this mess, I was born. My mom got bitter and angry and started mocking my father at every possible occasion as her revenge. She never had a kind word for him. From what I can piece together, my innocent admiration of my dad triggered his addiction, and he poured all of his shame and his grief onto me, making me feel like a used Kleenex, something dirty that belongs in the trash. Now, I tried to explain to my mom what was going on, but I didn't have a lot of words. All I could say was, I'm bad. I I've been bad. She said I was being ridiculous. She couldn't listen because I was a living reminder of the abuse she had suffered at my age. My existence was painful to her, and she started beating me. So during the day, my mom would beat me, and at night, my dad would come into my room and abuse me. I decided that I had to get away. There were times, though, when we looked like a normal family. Kids at school would talk about doing fun activities with their parents over the weekend, and their parents seemed to like each other, love each other, and that was not what I had going on at home. It took me a long time to realize just how different my family was. The abuse doesn't happen every day. It's a couple times a week, and you kind of block it out and pretend it doesn't happen because you don't know how to process it. The memories really kicked in when I was away at college in a different state. The way I see it, people who commit sexual assault have an addiction of sorts. And I think an addiction is an insanely insatiable blind craving to escape horrible feelings, feelings that are so horrible, self-harm or harming someone else seems like a small price to pay. Let me say that again. I believe an addiction is an insatiable blinding craving to escape really horrible feelings, feelings that are so bad, self-harm or harming someone else seems normal. Has anyone here ever known an alcoholic or an addict? It's a heartbreaking situation. Just quit drinking, just quit doing drugs. Seems like the obvious answer, but it's not that easy. 
that alcohol is a symptom of a deeper problem. If you have six DUIs, maybe you should stop drinking and driving. Maybe you should stop drinking altogether. Doesn't work that way. The alcohol helps escape the horrible feelings. So the self-harm, again, is a small price to pay. And what are these horrible feelings? Well, I will say, the, again, the curse of the incest survivor is that I am inherently flawed. I am ugly and unworthy and garbage. Where did these feelings come from? Well, I was treated like garbage by my abusers. In my case, my parents. So yes, I decided that I had to get away. I fired them. This was back in 1991, so it was a lot easier to just get rid of them than it would be today. I, I cut contact. There are some unobvious consequences to this decision. I became an orphan of sorts, an orphan by choice is what I called myself. I don't go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Mother's Day and Father's Day can be really difficult days for me. And I don't get Christmas presents or birthday presents. Let's think about that. Most people get Christmas presents from their family, maybe from friends, but mostly from family. Christmas is a big family holiday, and most people get birthday presents from family. So I spend Christmas alone, I spend my birthdays alone. So it gets awkward. And it gets awkward at work, too. I'm definitely not the only incest survivor in the world. But at work, people love to talk about their plans for the holidays. When people find out that I'm not going home, I get some interesting reactions. I generally say that my parents had a messy divorce, which is true. But here are some things not to say that people have actually told me. Oh my God, my family is everything. I just couldn't imagine life without them. That's so sad. Or, oh my God, you're not going home? What are you, an ungrateful child? Look, if a stranger had raped me, no one would expect me to go to prison and spend Christmas with that rapist. I believe the fact that my parents abused me outweighs the fact that they're technically my parents. Now, in a, business, excuse me, in a social setting, it's awkward too. Common icebreaker questions are, where are you from? How many brothers and sisters do you have? Usually, I again bring up the messy divorce, but where I'm from is complicated because I move around a lot. I could be from DC, Philly, New York, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. These are all places that I've lived. So please just be a little more open-minded and compassionate if I'd much rather hear about you. I understand that amazing families exist. Please understand that people like me exist. Now in a romantic setting, it's even more complicated. Uh, I need to have a conversation with the guy before the clothes start coming off. He needs to know, for example, I was raped was a long time ago, and I've done a lot of work on myself, but that's a conversation we need to have before the clothes come off. Now, sometimes we leave it at that, but sometimes there are questions. What? How? Huh? So here are things not to say. Oh my God, your biological father? No way, not your stepfather, your biological father. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, I I'm sure. Or this also happened to me. Oh my God, I feel traumatized just hearing about this. I'm like, dude, I lived it, okay? So here are things to say instead. Wow, Sadia, you are really brave and really strong. Thank you so much for telling me this. Or, hey, Sadia, no one deserves to be treated that way. Thank you for telling me this. Now, I like to compare my situation to being a child of divorce, which I am. Society understands divorce. No one's really shocked or horrified by that, even though it is sad. 50 or 60 years ago, people who are gay had to hide that part of their identity, much in the same way I hide being an incest survivor. Back in the day, they might have had to hem and haw about their significant other, the way I gloss over details about my family. The reason I am here today speaking out is I hope to raise awareness and increase compassion for people like me who are survivors of sexual assault. Now this next part is if you yourself are a survivor. The first thing I wanna say is it is absolutely not your fault. Not your fault. And you are not alone. 57,000 American children are abused every year, sexually abused, so you're not alone. And number three, please make a plan for when bad thoughts come. 
Suicidal thoughts and self-harm impulses might enter your brain. These are things that have helped me. First, I created a safe space. It can be any place you want, a chair, a corner, any place in your dorm room, your apartment, your house, but pick it out, point it out, and name it. This is my safe space. And understand that when you go there, you won't do any self-harm, because those feelings will pass. And second, if things get really, really bad, please wait 24 hours before you start thinking about a permanent solution. This is what I do. I shake my fist at the sky, and I announce the time. Well, let, let me show you. <sighs> Today is Tuesday, and it is 2.45 PM, and I am putting the universe on notice. Do you hear me? If things don't get better in 24 hours, I will quit. Then I have to take three actions to reach out. I can post on social media, having a rough day, text a friend, hey man, I need help. Nowadays, you can call the new suicide hotline, which is 988. Sometimes I just sit in a corner and ask the universe, who can help me? My name is Sadia Caron, and yes, I am an incest survivor. It is one part of my identity, but there are other parts too, and I'd like to take a moment to share them with you now. I made a video, so let's take a look.